Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing my review of A Fall of Moon Dust by Arthur C. Clarke. Now, as always, I'm going to start by reading the blurb. The blurb is terrible, but, um... The book is alright. <laughs> the most plausible and exciting story of its kind that I have yet read, Dennis Wheatley. The setting of this novel is the moon in the 21st century and it is depicted with brilliant imagination. But the vital core of the book is this. Will the crew and passengers of the dust cruiser Selene, buried 15 metres down in the Sea of Thirst, be rescued before half a dozen possible catastrophes overcome them? As an adventure story of great originality and continuous suspense, there has been little to equal it for years. Superbly ingenious and exciting new twists, Daily Express. The best and most exciting science fiction novel for years, Evening Standard. And there's a cool little bio here of Arthur C. Clarke. Arthur C. Clarke is one of the giants of science fiction. More than two million of his books have been sold throughout the world. Twice chairman of the British Interplanetary Society, he is the winner of the 1962 Kalinga Prize awarded by UNESCO for the popularisation of science. Nice. So let's check out some of the tabs. We get a reference to Old Man River which is in my head at the moment because uh, it's a song from Showboat, the musical, it's sang by Paul Robeson, and I love Paul Robeson. So uh, Susie and I have been listening to Paul Robeson vinyls and we are gonna watch Showboat at some point, even though it may very well be racist. This made me chuckle as well. Commissioner Davis riffled mentally through the items that had arrived by the last Telefax, wondering if there was anything here that would help him. There was, of course, the usual request from a TV company he'd never heard of, anxious to make yet another documentary on the moon, if all expenses were paid. The answer to that one would be no. If he accepted all these kind offers, his department would soon be broke. Let me get a reference to Poe. I'm just going to read this paragraph. Taking his time, Pat made two complete circuits of the lake while the floodlights played upon its enclosing walls. This was the best way to see it. During the daytime, when the sun blasted it with heat and light, it lost much of its magic. But now it belonged to the kingdom of fantasy, as if it had come from the haunted brain of Edgar Allan Poe. Ever and again one seemed to glimpse strange shapes moving at the edge of vision, beyond the narrow range of the lights. It was pure imagination, of course. Nothing moved in all this land except the shadows of the sun and earth. There could be no ghosts upon a world that had never known life. And I'm going to read this bit out. Um, Skipper of 20-seat dust cruiser and Commodore of Space stared at each other in silence as their minds circled the same problem. Then, cutting across the low murmur of conversation, they heard a very English voice call out, I say, miss! This is the first decent cup of tea I've drunk on the moon. I thought no one could make it here. My congratulations. The Commodore chuckled quietly. He ought to thank you, not the stewardess, he said, pointing to the pressure gauge. Pat smiled rather wanly in return. That was true enough. Now that he had put up the cabin pressure, water must be boiling at nearly its normal sea level temperature back on Earth. At last they could have some hot drinks, not the usual tepid ones. But it did seem a somewhat extravagant way to make tea, not unlike the reputed Chinese method of roasting pig by burning down the entire house. Glad to be vegan. And uh, we have Tom here, and uh, I like this little reference to Sherlock Holmes. He considered the situation with a coldly critical intelligence. Now, how would the great Holmes have tackled the problem? It was characteristic of Tom that one of the few men he really admired had never existed. And I like this last line of this, this paragraph here. And so did Father Vincent Ferraro, SJ, a scientist of a very different kind. It was a pity that he and Tom Lawson were never to meet. The resulting fireworks would have been quite interesting. Father Ferraro believed in God and man. Dr. Lawson believed in neither. I think I'm with Dr. Lawson on this one, to be honest. We get some references to some books here. Basically, once this uh, ship is like buried under the sand, they're trying to find ways to keep morale up and to keep people busy. There was much scrabbling in handbags and baskets. The total haul consisted of assorted lunar guides, including six copies of the official handbook, a current bestseller, The Orange and the Apple, whose unlikely theme was a romance between Nell Gwynn and Sir Isaac Newton, a Harvard Press edition of Shane, with scholarly, with scholarly annotations by a professor of English, an introduction of the logical positivism of August Comte, and a week-old copy of the New York Times Earth edition. It was not much of a library, but with careful rationing, it would help to pass the hours that lay ahead. And they make a pack of cards out of somebody, some, a journalist notebook. But I want to read the little paragraph here. Um, that was the lot. Quite a collection of talent, though not an unusual one. For the people who came to the moon always had something out of the ordinary, even if it was only money. But all the skill and experience now locked up in Selene could not, so it seemed to Harris, do anything to help them in their present situation. That was not quite true, as Commodore Hanstein was now about to prove. He knew, as well as any man alive, that they would be fighting boredom as well as fear. They had been thrown upon their own resources. In an age of universal entertainment and communications, they had suddenly been cut off from the rest of the human race. Radio, TV, telefax, news sheets, movies, telephone. All these things meant no more to them than to the people of the Stone Age. They were like some ancient tribe gathered around the campfire in a wilderness that held no other men. Even on the Pluto run, thought Commodore Hanstein, they had never been as lonely as this. 
this. They had had a fine library and had been well stocked with every possible form of canned entertainment and could talk by tight beam to the inner planets whenever they wished. But on Selene, there was not even a pack of cards. We get a reference to Ibsen, who is Norwegian. It's uh, like on the quiz shows that I watch, very frequently asked question is, which Norwegian playwright? And it's always Ibsen. And we get this little exchange here, which made me think of Stephen King. What do you think happened to them, George? I don't believe they're here. Where else can they be? Kidnapped by outsiders? I'm almost ready to buy that, was the half serious answer. Sooner or later, all astronauts believed, the human race would meet intelligence from elsewhere. That meeting might still be far in the future, but meanwhile the hypothetical outsiders were part of the mythology of space and got the blame for everything that could not be explained in any other way. And we get this great bit talking about the books they have on board. I object to wasting our time on the orange and the apple, said Miss Morley. It's utter trash and most of it is uh, near pornography. How do you know? asked David Barrett, the Englishman who had commended the tea. The only answer was an indignant sniff. <laughs> so I want to read this, this section here. I think this is nicely written. Had any eavesdropper been listening to the sounds inside Celine, he would have been very puzzled. The cabin was reverberating unmelodiously to the sound of 21 voices, in almost as many keys, singing happy birthday to you. When the din had subsided, Commodore Hanstein called out, anyone else besides Mrs. Williams just remembered that it's his or her birthday? We know, of course, that some ladies like to keep it quiet when they reach a certain age. There were no volunteers, but David Mackenzie raised his voice above the general laughter. There's a funny thing about birthdays. I used to win bets at parties with it. Knowing that there are 365 days in the year, how large a group of people would you think was needed before you had a 50-50 chance that two of them shared the same birthday? After a brief pause while the audience considered the question, someone answered, Why, half of 365, I suppose? Say 180? That's the obvious answer, and it's completely wrong. If you have a group of more than 24 people, the odds are better than even that two of them have the same birthday. That's ridiculous. 24 days out of 365 can't give those odds. Sorry, it does. And if there are more than 40 people, nine times out of 10, two of them will have the same birthday. There's a sporting chance that it might work with the 22 of us. What about trying it, Commodore? Very well. I'll go around the room and ask each one of you for his date of birth. Oh no, protested Mackenzie. People cheat if you do it that way. The dates must be written down so that nobody knows anyone else's birthday. An almost blank page from one of the tourist guides was sacrificed for this purpose and torn up into 22 slips. When they were collected and read, to everyone's astonishment and Mackenzie's gratification, it turned out that both Pat Harris and Robert Bryant had been born on May 23rd. I like this little line here. Much of Lawson's rudeness, he decided, was indifference to the social graces rather than defiance of them. And this is really interesting as well. He could tell by the expressions of those around him that this was the moment that separated the men from the boys. Until that helmet was seated, you were still part of the human race. Afterwards, you were alone in a tiny mechanical world of your own. There might be other men only centimetres away, but you had to peer at them through thick plastic, talk to them by radio. You could not even touch them except through double layers of artificial skin. Someone had once written that it was very lonely to die in a spacesuit. For the first time, Tom realised how true that must be. And then we get this awful idea where they decide to set up a, like a, a court where they're going to investigate why everybody decided to go to the moon. And one woman says, that's an easy one to answer. They told me I'd weigh only 20 kilos here, so I came. For the record, why did you want to weigh 20 kilos? Mrs. Scheuster looked at Harding as if he had said something very stupid. I used to be a dancer once, she said, and her voice was suddenly wistful, her expression far away. I gave that up, of course, when I married Irving. Oh dear, we're gonna start getting all Jeremy Kyle up in this submerged spaceship. Uh, the currency is called sterling dollars, or stollars, which I like. Uh, that reminded me of Red Dwarf, because the, the currency in Red Dwarf is the dollar pound. And then we get an excerpt from this book, and so I'm gonna read it out. The audience was thoroughly enjoying itself, especially as Barrett's English accent was now going full blast. Forsooth, Sir Isaac, you are indeed a man of great knowledge, yet methinks there is much that a woman might teach you. And what is that, my pretty maid? Mistress now blushed shyly. I fear, she sighed, that you have given your life to the things of the mind. You have forgotten, Sir Isaac, that the body also has much strange wisdom. Call me Ike, said the sage huskily, as his clumsy fingers tugged at the fastenings of her blouse. Not here in the palace, Nell protested, making no effort to hold him at bay. The king will be back soon. Do not alarm yourself, my pretty one. Charles is roistering with that scribbler peeps. We'll see naught of him tonight. If we ever get out of here, thought Pat, we must send a letter of thanks to the 17-year-old schoolgirl on Mars, who is supposed to have written this nonsense. She's keeping everyone amused, and that's all that matters now. Except one person isn't amused, Miss Morley. And um, we get this, uh, see what? Miss Morley. Oh, interrupted Susan, don't worry about her, poor thing. She's been eyeing you ever since we left base. You know what her trouble is. 
What? asked Pat, already uncomfortably sure of the answer. I suppose you could call it ingrowing virginity. It's a common complaint and the symptoms are always the same. There's only one cure for it. Great quote here at the start of chapter 16. Chief Engineer Lawrence did not believe the committees ever achieved anything. His views were well known on the moon, for shortly after the last biannual visit of the Lunar Board of Survey, a notice had appeared on his desk conveying the information. A board is long, hard and narrow. It is made of wood. We get this little bit here about uh, Pat and Susan, who've basically been having kind of like a love affair while they've been trapped. Have you mentioned him to Sue, uh, Miss Wilkins? She pointed him out to me. I should have guessed that thought, Pat admiring me. Not much gets past her. Now that it seemed he might have a future after all, he had begun to think very seriously about Sue and what she had said to him. In his life, he had been in love with five or six girls, or so he could have sworn at the time, but this was something different. He had known Sue over a year and from the start had felt attracted to her, but until now it had never come to anything. What were her real feelings, he wondered. Did she regret that moment of shared passion, or did it mean nothing to her? She might argue, and so might he for that matter, that what had happened in the airlock was no longer relevant. It was merely the action of a man and a woman who thought that only a few hours of life remained to them. They had not been themselves. But perhaps, sorry, Kat just came in, but perhaps they had been. Perhaps it was the real Pat Harris, the real Susan Wilkins, that had finally emerged from disguise, revealed by the strain and anxiety of the past few days. He wondered how he could be sure of this, but even as he did so, he knew that only time could give the answer. If there, were a if there was a clear-cut scientific test that could tell you when you're in love, Pat had not yet come across it. I like this little note here from uh, the film crew that are like reporting on this disaster. The moon, thought Jules, certainly presented some headaches to the cameraman. Everything was subtle sort of whitewash. There were no nice, soft halftones. And, of course, there was that eternal dilemma of the stars, though that was an aesthetic problem rather than a technical one. The public expected to see stars in the lunar sky, even during the daytime, because they were there. But the fact was that the human eye could not normally see them. During the day, the eye was so desensitised by the glare that the sky appeared an empty, absolute black. If you wanted to see the stars, you had to look for them through blinkers that cut off all other light. Then your pupils would slowly expand, and one by one the stars would come out until they filled the field of view. But as soon as you looked at anything else, foot, out they went. The human eye could look at the daylight stars, or the daylight landscape, it could never see both at once. But the TV camera could, if desired, and some directors preferred it to do so. Others argued that this falsified reality. It was one of those problems that had no correct answer. Jules sided with the realists and kept the Stargate circuit switched off unless the studio asked for it. This is nice as well, this is about one of the passengers. Because Carl Johansson was a nucleonics engineer, had a sensitive nose and happened to be sitting at the rear of the bus, he was the one who spotted the approach of disaster. He remained quite still for a few seconds, nostrils twitching, then said, excuse me, to his companion in the aisle seat and strolled quietly to the washroom. He did not wish to cause alarm if there was no need, especially when rescue seemed so near. But in his professional lifetime, he had learned, through more examples than he cared to remember, never to ignore the smell of burning insulation. And uh, this final thing I want to read out. This was a big day for poor Roris, and indeed for the whole moon. He wished that Sue could be here, but she was hardly in proper shape for the trip. Very literally, as she had remarked when he kissed her goodbye that morning, I don't see how women could have ever had babies on Earth. Fancy carrying all this weight around in six times our gravity. Mm. So yeah, overall, I did enjoy A Fall of Moon Dust by Arthur C. Clarke. Uh, I don't think it's one of his particularly well-known ones, but I actually thought it was a really solid sci-fi novel. Uh, and actually agree with a terrible blurb that's very hyperbolic. But it's true, it's a good read. I would recommend it. Four out of five. So there we have it, that's what I made of A Fall of Moon Dust by Arthur C. Clarke. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book, and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.